It's not that, it's more the WebEx issue. I thought it's faster because I thought this guy is already on WebEx before I joined. Are you sure you've heard that already? No, I'm not. So that's why I thought the presentation laptop that is dialed into WebEx would be the fast option, but you want to try to go out And it has Windows. Let's see what's buggy for that. Let's try this. Oh, sign in to activate Office. Okay, so more PowerPoint for you. Okay, it's on the GitHub repository, right? Yeah. So we can show it from my laptop. That should work. I'm Matthias Kovac, uh, and uh, I'm now working on uh, some kind of new topics. So the general background is industrial IoT, where we have kind of a different setting than the wireless uh, that we see in the home. Um, one technology that I'm now working with is uh, so-called time-sensitive networking. Um, that's a group of standards that's defined by the IEEE. Uh, it's somehow related to DetNet. DetNet is kind of deterministic networking at layer three. And there's also deterministic networking at layer two. That's this uh, TSN group of uh, standards. And uh, another background is that the OPC Foundation is uh, having a new activity called uh, field level communications. Um, basically, uh, so far they have been uh, working on the management level. So if you have your controller, how to get diagnostics, how to configure it, and so on, this uh, could be done vendor independent through OPC UA. But below that, usually you had uh, the typical field classes like Profinet, Ethercat, and so on. So there you had uh, still a uh, yeah, whole bunch of different systems that are not interoperable, uh, have basically this vendor lock-in uh, connected to it. And the idea is that uh, OPC UA can also become a cross-vendor standard that goes down to the field level. So talking to devices, uh, connecting uh, controllers, industrial controllers between different vendors and so on. And uh, of course, for industrial networks, you want to have this deterministic ability. Uh, and so they base uh, the real time performance and so on on TSN. So we now have two new ecosystems uh, TSN on top of that OPC UA. And uh, this kind of uh, gives you a vendor independent stack for industrial IoT. And uh, overall, this is a kind of a good use case for. Web of Things, where we try to describe existing ecosystems. And I now have my slides. Um, yeah, this was the background. Um, just here, a small chart. Uh, most of the communication in industry is still wired. Uh, they want to rely on it. Um, there's only a small share of maybe 6% wireless. It's growing, but still the rest is uh, connected. So that's why TSN with Ethernet or based on Ethernet is uh, an important target. And uh, one thing is you have to configure this connectivity. I already talked about this uh, FLC, the field level communication activity. So um, before it was uh, yeah, going up to the management, now it's really going down to the devices. And uh, what uh, I have been doing in this project, uh, or rather a student that is currently visiting, uh, Lucas Guillo from uh, University of Bologna, <laughs> has been working on this, uh, how to describe this with uh, ping descriptions, and then how to combine this with the network configuration. Uh, to give you an idea how OPC UA looks like, so on the left uh, is a screenshot from a tool that can uh, speak OPC UA. Um, you have uh, multiple nodes there. They are addressable uh, with a rather complex scheme. So you have a namespace that you have to provide. Uh, you provide an identifier for the node. And uh, as I summarize uh, here, there are actually different uh, types of identifiers. You can give it an integer number, you can give it a string, it could be something binary. So you have many, many options there. And each of these nodes can be of a specific class. So either it's uh, like an object, it could be a variable, um, but even methods are uh, typed like this. So you have this strong typing in OPC UA, 
And uh, another thing is that uh, it's inspired by the web, but it made everything more complex again. So the web was successful because it was so simple. They thought it's better if you have more options and make it complex again. So they are bi-directional references, which was actually uh, why all the other hypermedia systems died out there and the web succeeded. Um, you have to deal with bitmaps, you have to deal with word sizes uh, when you communicate data. And um, this is where uh, a lot of friction is created. If you want to describe it with uh, yeah, newer technology, if you look at CBOR or JSON and so on, you don't care about the, how many bits uh, a certain integer has on the uh, and is there a standard device. URI scheme for nodes? So OPC UA, um, hasn't uh, filed anything with IANA. In their own uh, documents, they always use uh, opc.tcp or .udp, um, but that then only has a host name and port to identify uh, the entry point to an OPC UA server. And from there, um, basically nothing is defined. Uh, one thing uh, that actually comes from, or comes here when we want to do the mapping, uh, we have to find out what fits together. And uh, on the last line, you see that uh, you have to have a combination of the server address, the namespace, and the uh, node ID. And this is something that we then can put in there. Um, later, I will talk a bit about uh, what are different options we have and so on. Um, otherwise, I mean, from, from a high level, it looks uh, quite well. So if you take an OPC UA server plus uh, some uh, so-called PubSub functionality, that would be something that corresponds to the Serbians in the web of things. Uh, in the FLC, there's something now defined called functional entity that pretty much corresponds to a thing in, in our sense. If you have variables, they can be treated like properties, methods, actions, and uh, something that comes in with uh, FLC uh, more dominant, but is actually also available in the existing specification uh, called PubSub are data sets that uh, yeah, are defined and regularly published. Um, those basically map to events. Um, the other ecosystem, I already introduced the uh, TSN in my uh, stand-up speech. So there are a lot of these ugly abbreviations. Uh, it's all built around the IEEE 802.1Q standard. So that's basically the, the standard that defines uh, VLANs and uh, switching, so bridges, endpoints, and, and so on. And basically the VLAN header is used to encode priority and some additional information to, to manage this deterministic uh, traffic. So how does it work? Um, so the blue boxes are switches, switches here. Uh, we have a bunch of different end nodes. Uh, basic uh, capability, what we are currently using is if you have end devices that are not TSN aware, you can still uh, reserve uh, bandwidth between the switches. And uh, if this is like the only ethernet cable, um, you have one application here, there is no, uh, interference, there are no other uh, applications talking or stealing bandwidth, uh, you're fine here. And then on these trunks where you have to share actually the cables, uh, there you can reserve the bandwidth so that those endpoints still can uh, perform in a certain way. And uh, for instance, if you have cross traffic, uh, important uh, signals uh, like control messages and so on, won't be dropped by the switches because they have reserved uh, queues. And uh, you also have a model how long it would take between the switches at least. So basically, I'm sorry, these are gateways and routers, these endpoints where the traffic gets mixed. These, yeah. these are switches. So um, I'm talking about IEEE 802.1. So this is Ethernet, those are Ethernet switches. Okay, so what you're saying is that TSN needs a guarantee latency. Yeah. Because we have to guarantee you know, a certain time slot. Uh, time yeah, time. so um, I'll get to more but details. Progress along right? So, I mean, right. the point that the situation at the moment is uh, you don't find on the market uh, TSN enabled endpoints yet. So, mostly it's prototypes that you find. Uh, often they're even still FPGA based. Um, if you have a TSN enabled end device, they can do way more. They uh, can uh, basically sync the application to the network access. Um, and you can have a real deadline guarantee. So, you can also define how much should be the jitter that your message arrives early or late. Uh, so you have uh, basically what is often called uh, isochronous network access in, uh, in the industrial network. So basically that the application is even aware of the timing in your network. And uh, how is this done? So in these switches that are TSN capable, 
is that they basically have um, eight different uh, queues to store these packets, and each um, <laughs> queue uh, belongs to a certain priority that is defined in the VLAN header. So therefore, there are eight, and you can assign then specific traffic to a specific queue. And what you then can also do is you define uh, certain timestamps when the gate for each queue should be open and closed. And this way, basically, you get something uh, indicated here at the bottom uh, that you have some kind of uh, time uh, dimensional multi multiplex to access uh, the, the Ethernet uh, medium. And uh, one thing is either you divide it uh, by traffic classes. Um, so that means that multiple frames from multiple applications get one uh, reserved window. You can also do something called uh, frame isolation where then uh, basically a single application or a single frame gets its own window and will be delivered. Um, in detail, that of course is then also getting a bit more complex. If you have multiple switches, you basically have to grow this time window because there's always some kind of jitter. So uh, the state of the art is actually rather pack them together. Overall, you get a better performance. Now the basic mechanism is queuing. There is no physical division of frequency to the resolving no, it's uh, time time based. Yeah, it's uh, so. So at the moment, I mean, there are different things. So this all started with uh, audio video uh, bridging, uh, where it was basically traffic shaping with the so-called uh, credit based yeah. shaper. And now there's a time aware shaper where you basically use the precision time protocol to sync all your nodes and then have the time um, multiplexing to reserve. Uh, yeah, that's it. Because twenty years ago, at IBM, we did isochronous and six that was reserved. Mm -hmm. and so, so, yeah, so the, the main point here is that it's actually um, still allowing best effort traffic. So, if you have these nodes, um, your yeah. IT nodes, and so on, they can still share the same tables, the same infrastructure. So, um, <coughs> because of that, TSN is also a technology that allows you to really convert your network so that all your IT infrastructure in a factory, for instance, can use the same tables as your control infrastructure. Question. Okay. Uh, yeah, then. Yes, I have just one comment. So, yeah. I was working for the W3C Media Brazil, and uh, they have also been. Sorry, Kass, put, put your weight uh, shortly. We have to crank up the volume. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Not deterministic. Uh, it's uh, up to here. Collaboration might be used. People are talking at normal. In the chat. Now it's uh, yeah, I can't. Yeah. Okay, so oh, okay. maybe you go ahead and run class types in the chat room. Okay. Yeah. Then Ari, can you basically take care of relaying? Sorry, Cass, the audio was completely broken. Um, I'll quickly continue. And if you can write, that would be great. OK. And uh, to manage uh, the, these networks at layer two, there are different approaches. Um, the one I'm showing here is a centralized model. There's also a distributed model using different protocols. And then, of course, a hybrid model that combines these two approaches. Um, what has to be done, basically, that um, you have uh, some entity that can talk to your applications and uh, can collect, uh, basically, the requirements, the quality of service parameters of the applications, and then talk to a networking uh, configurator, so the network controller, um, that uh, then basically translates the quality of service requirements to a certain schedule, so these gate control lists that I have been indicating to um, reserve resources on these uh, switches. And uh, this uh, central controller is then talking, usually using netconf to these devices. Um, there would be other options like restconf. Um, we are currently working on coreconf. 
Um, but for some reason, I found uh, that uh, NetConf is kind of the de facto standard what is deployed on uh, this kind of network equipment. Uh, RESTConf I have only seen as at SDN controllers uh, northbound uh, to configure this. And uh, in short, basically, what we also need besides an OPC UA binding to make this part of the web of things is, uh, in this case, a NetConf binding uh, to talk to these uh, switches. Um, here, uh, the mapping is also uh, possible, so we have a, a proof of concept uh, implemented. Uh, Luca did, did all the work here. Um, so if you have the overall stack on your embedded device, that would be the servient. Uh, we have then uh, the running NetConf server that has multiple data stores. This could be identified as the thing. Uh, the leaf nodes in this uh, model, so usually it's a Yang model that, that you have deployed there, um, would be the properties. Uh, Yang also supports RPCs. Those can be mapped uh, to actions. And you can also have notifications in this model. And uh, there we are with the events. And uh, basically, you have uh, an X path because it's XML-based NetConf into, uh, into this uh, data store describing uh, the nodes. So this is what we then take basically for the href part to build a NetConf URI to address uh, the individual parameters. Um, this is how the messages look like. As I mentioned, it's uh, XML-based. Um, there's a lot you can ignore. Uh, there is basically under the RPC a node that identifies what is the method that you want to apply. There's get, there's edit config, and then you can define custom RPCs to do something on, on the data. And um, there are some or multiple choices. Actually, one way is to basically build up uh, nested nodes that uh, correspond to the X path to describe what you want to change. And uh, the same thing is also if you want to write something, you include these nodes and then have the actual configuration data embedded there. Um, there is uh, one pitfall is that um, there are actually multiple data stores. So one is representing what is really running on the switch. There's a candidate store where basically you can uh, first do a multiple uh, configurations and then do a, do a commit to atomically apply a new configuration. And you can also read out what is the startup configuration. So when this thing reboots, what will be the, the default configuration. Um, this then leads to a number of design decisions that we had to make uh, for the bindings. Um, I think I won't go into detail here. Um, it's on the slides if you're interested. Uh, the main takeaway here is so we have uh, a lot of options here. I marked some of the not so good choices in red. Um, we did the same basically for OPC UA. Um, if you have these existing ecosystems that are, say, built in a different time with uh, different ideas, different mechanisms, it's getting quite hard to apply Web of Things. And I think uh, this is actually an exercise that has to be done that we look more into these existing ecosystems and concentrate more on the uh, complicated cases to really understand, do we have everything covered? Is there something missing? And there are always choices. We basically drop a few uh, things. What are, the, what are the configuration parameters that we're talking about for OPC UA? Slots. So OPC UA is um, basically, we get some standard uh, layered model for industry uh, IoT. And OPC UA would be the application that is basically something that would correspond to the web with HTTP or the, to the core ecosystem. This is nothing that is has, uh, it's modeled in Yang or whatsoever. OPC what, what, what I'm asking is, um, I guess what I'm asking why is there PCUA on the top one slide here? What does it have to do with that? Okay, uh, so this, this, um, so the the starting point was at the moment there are all different kind of uh, vendor specific protocols, and uh, there is some convergence going on. And the main convergence that uh, we can see at the moment is that OPC uh, that has really a broad base, a lot of vendors are in there. They are now specifying something that can work at the field level and to have deterministic behavior at the field level, they build on top of TSN. So to get basically the full stack you need for industrial applications, you use TSN as the basis to converge the, the layer two infrastructure. And on top of that, you have an OPC UA field level communication to also have convergence at the application layer. Okay. Yeah, so um, the, all the big vendors are in there. So things like, Ethercad, Profinet, and so on, they are expected to be superseded at some point by OPC FLC. So the, the, the real question, so the, will it be um, OPC FLC that delivers the, the appropriate 
this in slot information, or will, it, will that happen below? So actually, there is. Uh, I didn't want to go into too much detail. There is a step in between, which is the IEC IEEE 6802 um, working group. They are defining an industrial profile uh, for TSN. Um, within that, you have different kind of classes. And, uh, but this is basically the definition, what will be the parameters, uh, the, the selections and so on, what an industry application should be able to configure at the network level. So my, my next question is, how dynamic is this? Can the device be expected to have this based on its, on its uh, structure? Or is it a configuration? It's a really configuration. A real configuration. So basically, usually you buy a PLC, so it's it's multi-layered again. So I guess we are going in a slightly different correct, uh, direction, but I think it's also interesting to to look into industrial IoT. So usually devices you can buy off the shelf, and you just plug them in, and then they get a minimal configuration. Uh, but you don't have to do so much controllers. On the other hand, you usually need an engineering tool where you then basically install a software or model the software that should be running there. So that is then really dynamic. And the main is then going on in the engineering where you say which controller should control, uh, talk to other controllers, which controller takes care of which device and so on. So you get a lot of these uh, so-called application relationships uh, when you apply these kind of off-the-shelf components to produce either a car, uh, bread, or whatsoever. So um, it's something that overall is probably done once at the design time of a factory. Um, but what you see uh, nowadays is that uh, it becomes more and more dynamic. So batch size one is one uh, keyword here. Other things are that uh, you want to evolve more easily and reconfigure at new devices. Uh, for instance, to have some uh, predictive or preventive uh, maintenance uh, use cases fulfilled and so on. And so this, but there's signaling type. Uh, signaling, sorry, what you, I mean, so it is implemented and realized at uh, layer two, but basically who has to talk to whom is defined at the application level where the, the engineering tools come in. Question as well, the data schema extensions, same issue arises up to the one data model. Yeah, like bit, 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 and it would be nice if we could coordinate our efforts here to the model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, this is a, a side project. Um, so uh, it's a visiting researcher doing this currently in our lab. Um, we are working on a paper on this. So maybe I just go on with my presentation because uh, I actually cover this. Um, so this is uh, the overall setup, how it would look like. Uh, so you have your devices in the field. So for instance, some sensors, an actuator, um, something that is an actuator, but also provides you with information about a certain position, for instance. Uh, you have your uh, TSN fabric there, and somewhere you have your application. So this uh, basically would have been a hardware PLC, so programmable logic controller. Now you often see it's soft PLCs, virtual PCs, running on edge compute nodes. And uh, for instance, our uh, servient could be uh, providing something like this. And uh, what we implemented is basically the actual mashup application. So this is telling the, the um, equipment what to actually do. And we have implemented a TSN controller app that basically takes the quality of service requirements and uh, turns this into network configuration and is able to take it out. So the workflow would be that um, the mashup application fetches the uh, TDs from the devices as usual, um, but those are then enhanced with these uh, quality of service capabilities of the infrastructure. You then match um, these capabilities to your actual quality of service requirements. So basically the application has to decide how often, for instance, you want to update the position of the robot, how fast as uh, the transport system should be controlled, how often you want to read out the positioning from the sensor and so on. And uh, once you uh, have made certain choices within the bounds of the quality of service capabilities, you can uh, talk to the uh, controller app. That one uh, tries to push out the schedule. So first it has to translate and actually calculate the schedule. That is a, a NP hard problem actually to come from the requirements down to uh, the state control list. So there are, is a lot of investigation, network calculus and so on to actually do that. I try to uh, push it out and then basically report back uh, if uh, the setup worked. Uh, what are these quality of service uh, parameters? So for instance, devices 
um, often have a minimal uh, interval to actually be able to process data that is coming in. Uh, message sizes are important to do the allocation of the network. Uh, you want to know, for instance, a send offset. Um, so the time between the sensor reading is taken and when it hits actually the network, you really want to have a tight timing here uh, down in the, the microsecond uh, range. Uh, there might be some receive offset. So if I send a command, know the network delay, how long does it still take in the device itself to actually apply that? And also what is the clock synchronization? What is the mechanism? There are several standards actually out there. And uh, on the side on the requirements, um, as I said, uh, the application knows usually what is the maximum interval. So how fast must this actually run to, to fulfill its purpose? What is the overall delay that is allowed that it uh, won't crash, for instance? Uh, what is the receive offset? So this, this jitter that set has to min minimize. And uh, this is probably not complete. So we are still collecting this and uh, yeah, hopefully have a good list in the paper later. So this QoS requirements for the thing. Are they supposed to be specified by the application writer, or are they some inherent properties of the description? Yeah, so my hunch, or what I try to establish, is that um, these are basically capabilities of the things. So if I produce this, I know what is the hardware capable of. So actually, I have to mention, dimension this, that a robot, for instance, is able to really quickly uh, process this. A sensor has maybe a lower one. And then what is possible by the hardware and so on is described here. And uh, the application, of course, then has to also choose and decide based on this what is possible. So, yeah. so if I understand correctly, what's going on here? <laughs> this, he, as we say, these, this is a static thing, right? Mm -hmm. This, this is information that the control that 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 the TSM controller needs in order to establish how to meet these requirements. Yes, indirectly, because uh, the, the TSM controller itself wouldn't be able to actually work with this. It still needs this translation step to really work on a network cycle, gate uh, control list terms, and so on. But yet, yeah, it's a different kind of representation of the same uh, knowledge or requirements. Okay. So this is used to essentially produce information for the network, if you will. Yeah. Okay. Mainly for the application, actually, and the application then can make the decisions and then have a resulting uh, requirement to make this run on this infrastructure. And this, these quality of service parameters are then translated to something uh, that would be pushed out uh, via NetConf, for instance. Sorry, but I think you probably underestimated how much this has to be out of the station. <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost there. I'm about to conclude. It's a good, good presentation. Very good. Um, so here, this is just for illustration. I mean, you would uh, need to import a new vocabulary in your TV. Uh, there are some global definitions, so that this is basically device level. For instance, here that uh, the dot one AS ref uh, mechanism is used for time synchronization. Uh, what is the minimal interval? Then there are some at uh, affordance level and maybe some at the form level. So basically, because uh, the maximum message size over HTTP will be different from uh, co-op, for instance. Um, I'm still not sure if we are ideally we can give frame sizes, so layer two information here. Uh, maybe there should actually be more abstraction. But if you really want to calculate in the end, you need to know how big is your frame really on on layer two. One issue is that we don't have a mechanism to actually give such metadata for applications. So so far we didn't define any container format whatsoever. Um, there is, however, some ongoing work. So we and uh, looked, I think it was uh, in an EU project or something, um, OSGI has uh, something that they use, which is the requirements and capabilities uh, document that they have. And also for network function virtualization, you have these kind of uh, descriptions, what are the requirements actually for this application to run, what hardware is required and so on. Yeah, we're looking at uh, packaging application WASM. On? On WASM. We're looking at uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, how, how do we encapsulate uh, installable software? Yeah. So uh, to conclude, uh, I mean, TSN is quite interesting because it really allows convergence there. Um, we need uh, these uh, quality of service parameters to have requests sent to the TSN uh, controller. Um, maybe site info TSN is also investigated for wider solutions, so TSN over Wi-Fi, um, but also 5G is a topic there. Um, yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, I actually have to catch up and uh, see what is else is going on there. Um, 
which is uh, pretty obvious. TD can provide the semantic information there. This is, uh, I mean, a first step. And I was quite uh, happy to see that this topic, which I wasn't even aware of when we started this project, that semantic uh, description for connectivity is actually a topic. So TD can also help there. And we are doing uh, the, the first steps in, in the paper that we are plan to publish. And another issue that we saw is that basically if you want to do these Web of Things bindings, um, the devil is in the details and uh, we need to make way more efforts there to figure out what do we need to, to fulfill this vision of convergence and have a uniform description of this all. There are some other pointers um, that we could discuss uh, maybe offline at a beer or whatsoever. And uh, I will cut it from here. Yes. I don't know if Cass put in his question. Yes, I got, I got a quick minute, so it was a comment. Uh, yeah, I've already put some comment to oh, okay. minutes. You want to read it out yourself? Okay, I'll read yeah. it out. So, was Cass saying, uh, what do you think about the WPC? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I changed the headset and, uh, yeah. As I mentioned, I've already put my comment directly to the minutes. Did you comment? Yeah, that, that was just that uh, I've been working on for the WC media rated groups and uh, they're working on uh, multiple video streams and synchronizing those video streams. And from WC, uh, WT viewpoint, I think uh, those video streams are bit uh, based, uh, yeah, data stream and uh, yeah, well, byte based stream and how to synchronize and deal with multiple streamlines uh, would be, yeah, useful for this discussion. I think the quality of service shows up in media delivery. It also shows up in uh, uh, web and networks group W3C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's related to web and networks as well. And uh, originally media and entertainment interest group. The real question is, is this, you know, like, uh, QoS extension, you know, uh, usable in other contexts. How general is it? Is it really specific to QoS? Yeah, so um, I was focusing on this TSN capabilities, which are really for control traffic. Right. As I mentioned, this is an extension to AVB, AV audio video bridging, right, right. where they started. So yeah. it's a good use case to also look into the, exactly. the multimedia yeah, part. Yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, actually, I proposed uh, during the TPAC meeting in Fukuoka in September, the WCWT group should uh, collaborate with the media related groups and uh, networking groups, yeah, about how to deal with uh, video stream, AV kind of video streaming, it's, yeah, based, yeah, for example, using some specific event sets. Okay. Thanks, Carl. Unfortunately, we need to move on to the next topic. So we actually yeah. have, yeah. we have, um, Minus 30 minutes for Matt and <laughs> Inais together. Um, we were planning to have the last half an hour for wrapping up and concluding everything. Maybe we can squeeze that into like 10 minutes, which would give us 20 minutes for both. How much, how you guys wanna? You both. We we'll just keep going and see how it goes. How yeah. We have until five here, now it's four o'clock. So, yeah, maybe try to keep it a bit shorter than we originally anticipated for well, us. And then we have 45 minutes at 2020. Oh, okay. Yeah. Discussion has been going on, so let's see how it goes. You have my slides. Um, All right, so I'm going to talk about manufacturing usage. Um, this, this arose from a problem that all of his customers are having. They're being inundated with IoT devices, and they need to know a little bit about them. So, what does that mean? You want to make it quick, <coughs> quick your way through here. Yeah. So, I can run off that if you want. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be going taking notes. So, okay. if you want to. So, you're a quicker. Yeah. I could just use this. 
is very USB. I could just, I could just, it's okay. We don't have to. All right, let's just see. So, um, today's problem, right? Let's talk about printers just for a moment. Okay, these actually, yeah, every, it's not IoT. Oh, yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> but it, in fact, it's probably the earliest IoT. It, it, because printers have been networked since. Marston was a young man. <laughs> um, and, and they still don't get it right. Which, and why should they? The rest of us don't get it right either. So, um, you know, this is a problem. Now, just, you saw a little cheat there, but would anybody care to guess what sort of access that printer really needs? It's good. It, 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 I'm sorry. But you would be crazy to guess. Because this is a, a short version of it. Now, we're geeks in this room, okay? Check it out. This HP printer uses Jabber. Okay? So it, it's using a chat protocol. Right? Who would have guessed that? Who gets to say what the printer gets to use? The only person who gets to say that is the designer. Not Cisco, not Huawei, not the W3C, the designer. So how is the Ford administrator even to discover this? He can sit there and listen quite a long time and try and figure out if he's gotten all the exception conditions. Um, and, 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 and this is one device, right? This recurs throughout the market, right? And however many types of devices there are, right? The administrator has to go and do that in order to figure out what sort of access a device needs. Now, why would anybody care what access a device needs on the network? And the answer is these devices cannot possibly defend themselves. Uh, they don't. They try, and they should try. They should keep trying. They should do better and better. But there are always going to be zero-day vulnerabilities. And so it's important that device manufacturer employ an additional layer of protection and that's where the network comes in not to trust the network in terms of its access but to provide the network with information such that the network can defend the device that's the purpose and this occurs across all markets smart cities industry consumer you name it it's there my cousin and I'm sorry for taking 20 minutes, part of my 20 minutes to tell us. My cousin just got a, a smart oven that woke her up at 5.30 in the morning to tell her that it needed to be clean. Okay. I asked her why on God's green earth you would allow that thing to be networked when just to tell you that it needs to be clean when it's actually a threat to the rest of her environment. And there is no protection. So this is where manufacturing research comes in. So let's talk about assumptions and assertions. From an assumption side, we start, we say a thing has a single or small number of uses. That's my definition, part of my definition of a thing. It's not general purpose computing. We're not trying to solve the problem for, for, an, for an Apple model. Okay. Things are tightly constrained. They have very little CPU, very little memory, very little battery. What's not on the slide and is most important, they have very little programmer time. That's the most precious thing. So any solution that we propose along these lines has to be simple and has to take very little time to programmers. At the end of the day, no matter what solution we propose, the network administrator gets to say what sort of access the device is going to have. Not Elliot, not Cisco, not Huawei, not Juniper, not the device manufacturer, but the administrator. And let's also assume that any device that claims to be secure, any, any manufacturer that claims their device is secure, is a lot or just know what they're talking about. Okay. Based on that, we have a couple of assertions we can make. Because a thing has a single or small number of uses, therefore we can enumerate those uses. And the people who are best in, uh, in position to enumerate those uses, because there are a single or small number of uses, is the manufacturer themselves. Okay. And the mechanism needs to protect devices that may have vulnerabilities. So um, this is not really technology conveniently. We've had access lists in the network 
since Carson was a young man. Um, so um, <laughs> that's so deep. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so the only question is, how do you choose the right ACLs? Right. So we introduced four specific new uh, architectural components that uh, in, into the existing environment. The first is a URL. Let's note that this is 1993 technology. Okay. The second is a mud manager, which we're going to associate with the AAA infrastructure because it's just easily associated with other components of the internet. The third is a description file, which we call a mud file, manufacturer usage descriptions. It's JSON. It has a couple of uh, it's based on a Yang model. And the fourth is a mud file server, which we will call Apache, right, which sits somewhere out there and delivers these mud files. So here's the flow really quickly. The device uh, emits a mud URL in some way, shape, or form, or it is otherwise learned. Uh, the, the, the network sort of pick that up, send it over to this mud manager, which could be an adjunct to your AAA server. The AAA server sees a URL. What's it going to do with it? It's going to do what it does with URLs. Looks it up. Goes to this file server. It's just a file, right? This is what it looks like. This is the, the actual new part that, that's you know, newer than 1999 technology. Here you have some JSON. And what we've done is we've taken the access list model. We're configuring the network. So we're, we're configuring network access. So we take that access list model, we abstract out the IP addresses. And in some cases, some cases alone, we need to fill in, we, we provide a template for the administrator to fill in some information as to what sort of access is needed. That then gets shipped all the way back into the, in, in, in its instantiated form into the network once an approval step has happened, because the network manager is the queen of the castle. And then the device is then microsecond. So you provide the appropriate network access, so the lighting switch can talk to the light bulbs, if you will, and a thermostat can talk to an HSAT. So the administrator doesn't play guessing games, right? You get policy, you get determinative policy, declarative policy, um, and the device is, is relatively automatically segmented. This saves us from the fact that we're running out of system administrators on this this is the problem that manufacturing usage was facing. To describe one of the earlier routing area directors of the IETF was Michael Dell, the only problem ever have to solve for is slow. This is what we're solving for here. So we can't really just throw out an RFC. Gotta have some tooling. <coughs> so starting with policy developers, the, the, the way this is being rendered is a little weird. We have this, we have something called mudmaker.org. And so you can do some policy authoring. You can go to mudmaker.org, click on it today, and you can try this out, right? You can take the result of the mud file and then visualize it. This is cool. This is, um, this, this is uh, I have a, 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 a grad student who did this for me over the summer. You can just visualize it. Pretty cool, right? And then we have some tooling that implements it. So this is an example of a template here. One of the things that MUD does, because it abstracts out the, the way that uh, the, the access is managed, you have your choice as to how you're going to deliver the access into your network. It can be through normal ACLs. It can be through open flow. It can be through uh, source group tags that Cisco offers, for instance. This is the really good tool that I'm sure here, right? So a couple of uh, important points. The first of which is MUD configures the network we're not configuring devices. There are no new control interfaces on the device. In fact, if you can bind a MUD URL to a device out of band without, you know, say on a label or something like that, you never have to touch the device at all and you can brownfield it. Right? Um, the device therefore requires no semantic understanding of what a MUD file is. The manufacturer does, but the device does not. Right? So very little processing. Right on the device. All it has to do is emit the mud URL, and even and, and because this is component architecture, if you can get the mud URL without the device emitting, that's fine. A good example might be LoRaWAN, right, where you, you have a table of, of keys for each your uh, for each device, and you have a device key table. You 
You could add an additional column for my URL. Works just fine. You could do that. Component architectures are cool. Okay. Um, the other thing is you can use what you want. You could discard the rest. That includes you could decide that all you want to do is take this for classification purposes. You only want to classify the device. You want to know what's on your network. Maybe you just want to make, make your own policies. Never mind what the manufacturer is delivering. Okay. Um, you could also not even bother imposing um, access controls. You could just simply use the information for auditing purposes, which I expect some people will do. You could perhaps take the, the, the money URL and buy a bomb import, right? or that's bomb import for that matter. Right? So the other key point here is that MUD can provide no more capability than what the underlying network provides already, because it's merely a network level. So if you have no access control mechanisms in your network, you're not going to get access control just because you're using them. Fortunately, most modern routers and switches have this capability. So that's pretty generally applicable. That's sort of cool, isn't it? So um, we've done a lot of work. We've focused on um, LP access primarily. <laughs> um, we want to do, there are different abstractions. I haven't gone into that from a mud perspective, but there's the a controller aspect, the same manufacturer, there's cloud-based domain name-based access that's, that, that's provided, and a couple of others, right? Um, just one or two areas um, we need to improve for automation. We already have some internet drafts to do that. Um, I would like to see a little bit more be uh, better integration in the consumer space for that in particular. Um, Michael Richardson has been working on that um, in, in, with the CIRA project. They were all at Montreal with us. Um, at the hackathon, um, we're, we need to look at reporting tools. So manufacturers can do this offering, they can do policy offering, policy visualization. Now they need feedback to know whether the device is actually gaining the access it needs to gain. And we need to work that problem while being privacy sensitive. Okay. Um, so we have pretty good functionality in 802.3 and 802.11 networks. I'd, I'd sort of like to expand that out to 802.15. Uh, 802.15.4 networks, um, and we've been talking about how to do this with PG5 as well. Um, no reason it couldn't be done for LoRaWAN. In fact, we've contemplated exactly how to do it. Um, and then we're, we're looking at various different extensions from us. One of the ones that we're looking at is TSN. So what, if, if, in, in your presentation, we talk about what the device declares. Well, who is it declaring it to? It's declaring it really to the network. Any, the network needs to be configured. Well, that's exactly what MUD's for. The only difference between what we propose and what's here, right, is merely the syntactic sugar around right? So you could do just as easy, you could do both just as easily. And the, the interesting thing about this is that you need to you, you need to add no new uh, interface mechanisms for say web of things in order to deliver that. Now, whether things is important when you have to think, think it's less important when you want to inform the network about the way a device is going to be designed. You don't, need, you don't need to have any sort of interface for, for, for those when the device is static and designed. I just want to comment that uh, still the application is quite important. He has a work out there. Um, uh, OPC uh, based uh, solutions, for instance, are also promoted. Um, this, what I presented, was just an export. So what is the apply that, uh, but there are also other applications that we want to do this. So right. I guess it's the question, what is the uh, universal interface that is already available? Right. For, for industry optimates that there are some of these uh, client or server available. So it, it's possible you can go around, but you can go about that in that way as well. The other possibility is to simply rip the information out of network interface. That would be the intent. How the network how, there's no promises made by that. No promises at all that the network's configured at all by that. Right. So you could potentially edit the mud and then the others can then apply to that. Absolutely. But then my next question is uh, so how we can work with the and I expect that by the way to happen as well. Yes, I mean I also also I mean I would assume that this will also be some of my my next questions. So whatever they are seeing the process of the application co op not the co-op. Uh, 
The only, the only reason we don't do that is that we don't assume any particular capability the device to provide. And the reason we assume that we didn't assume that is that um, the first assumption we made is that devices are really tight on memory, they're really tight on CPU, and they're not going to be able to provide it. That having been said, one could easily extend mine to say, I've got my own mud file here. But there's a reason, there's another thing you have to be careful about as you deliver these. DHCP and LLDP, as the line in the graph, are sort of second best as a way to get the money well. The way you really want to get it is by uh, either out of band or a certificate. And what, what, why a certificate? That particularly the manufacturer's certificate. Because you want the assertion about what the device is, not to come from the device itself, because that's a self assertion one is for that assertion to come from the manufacturer to say, this is a seamless deal. Who is so to say that it works Sorry? Who is so to say that it works for you? So if the a certificate lives on the device, whatever, right? But the point, the, the point being that you need that assertion to come. That a certificate is a unique way for the, the, the assertion to be made by the manufacturer where the, the assertion itself lives on the it is. 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 Write it into the graph. I encourage you to do it. Right. And, and actually, I'll give you the code that you can extend, that you can extend out the, the web manager to take. My understanding is where we can converge the problem of discovery of TVs to the problem of you know, uh, mud. And it seems that one fundamental issue is identifying the type of device in a secure and kind of fashion. But from the type of device, you can then indirectly find the mud file and maybe find the TV type. Uh, or the uh, SDM file. And then, uh, then the, it's almost like the, and also I also think TVs and MUDs are in some ways uh, complements each other. They are. In right. fact, let me tell you a little bit about that. Okay. And this is why I asked the questions I asked earlier. Right. right. Yeah. If, I'm, if I'm discovering the, the MUD URL out of band, I might as well have an extension that simply points to that, that could point to a TV. It will not have it will not have identity information about the device. It will not have a specific instant instance ID in there. Okay. We could certainly also conversely link to a mud file from the TV. You could if you discover the TV, you can then find the mud. I, I encourage I encourage it. So the, this is we, we, this RFC came out at the beginning of the year. Okay. This is a stretchable concept, right? The the only bounds of stretch that I see are these two. The first is that a mug file is intended, at least as I see it, to not be unique per device, but to be unique per type of device. And the, the second bound is that the, the mug file should probably configure the network and not the device or the devices in any way. But it's, it's about the it's it's about about device. It's, a, it's about how the device was designed Declaration. So keep in mind, this policy is abstract. It's a, the policies are like, I want to talk to my controller. I want to talk to um, the same devices the same type as me. That, that's the level that you get. How the network implements that is up to the local deployment. Right? So the mechanism to the 
mechanism to um, implement the evolve of the model. Also, the device may have may, may gain new functionality, and the mod file has in it essentially a timer or, or a, a, a cache value that says go look up the to see if the mod file has changed periodically. Okay. So that way we know if there's new behavior detection. So the, those are a couple of Approaches. And it also implies that the software version is part of the device type. Yeah. In software, it's just a new device. Right. Now, this is where you guys in the chip business are really going to help me out. Right? Because I've been banging my head on this problem. But I know, I know that you guys in that industry are looking for ways to update, uh, say, a certificate uh, based on the hardware. Now, the key thing for me in the long term is that I don't want the device to assert this. I provide a mechanism such that the device can assert now, but I really like to avert those out. But, I, but my manufacturers who I'm dealing with will never show up in this room, right? It took me two years to get them to emit a URL. That was, they, they you know, that's how difficult it was just to, just to use LLVP. They were already using. Right? So the, one of the goals here was to use existing interfaces because adding new interfaces on devices, apart from programmer time, is also um, very dangerous from a security standpoint. So I have taken up way more time than I set out with. I apologize. I will um, take questions maybe uh, out of the way. And, and Monday, there's going to be a side meeting. Oh, the Monday side meeting is mostly it's mostly about onboarding. But I'll be at the hackathon tomorrow. Come with come at me with whatever you have. If you want to hack, you want to hack co app with me? Let's hack co app. I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. On the slides, mm -hmm. uh, we really like slide numbers, mm -hmm. and we, we don't like suspicious things. I'll send you an update. You don't. Then supply an update. <laughs> I can supply an update. You're you're recording the Benoit audience. Okay. I'm actually on time. Oh, 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 <laughs> uh, so whoever is online and sleepy right now. All right, no, no, no. Sort of have Yeah. Um, the carrots will Good. 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 Those of you who have been around for a while have, have, uh, have heard about this thing nice before. I didn't talk about it for the first time in 2016. The difference between then and now is that, first of all, the use case we were talking about at that time was kind of what the original ICE was also mentioned, uh, designed for more like real time media devices. And Really didn't see that any use case in that variety, uh, at least not then. And, and, and that's not really the use case we're focusing there at this time either. Now it's more your co op or whatever protocol you're going to choose. I mean, we, I'm going to present how it's done for co op, but it's a generic concept you can use it for, for anything. Okay, so this is more like when, when you have a resource director, for example, it's resource heads devices which are, are behind that, so you can't really use the resource. The other thing is that also we're looking at it for, because there are some interesting semantic uh, aspects from here, uh, which I'm going to show in the, in the internet with regard to resource things and, and resources itself, and, and how, how it is uh, done. So basically, uh, one can take a long presentation about ICE. Uh, so I'm going to give a very short introduction. I mean, if you're aware why 
guys who probably have a lot of questions already. You're leading the way a lot, you're simplifying things and so on and so on. And I do that on purpose because this is not really about guys. This is just what you need to know in order to hopefully <laughs> need to know in order to. Uh, so what ICE is about is, is finding connectivity. When you have a device, and both devices may be behind that. Try, which means that the, the uh, if you're behind an app, I will not be able to contact you, contact you, you using your host address because it's a private IP address. So ICE is about finding IP addresses which I can use or at least try to contact you. So one IP address, the most typical one, is that when you establish a connection to a public network via NAT, that NAT is going to create a binding, and that binding is going to have a public IP address port. So, so, and then I can try, if I know what that is, I can try to contact you using that one. That's a basic. What is the ICE acronym stand for? Uh, interactive connectivity established, interactive, something like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, and that's basically what a candidate is. Candidate is, I mean, it has a little more metadata, but basically what it is is an IP address and port that I can try to contact. There are different types of candidates. Uh, as I said here, it, it, even your local address is a candidate because maybe you're not behind that. And then, of course, I will be able to, to use that. But there is also uh, this, oh, sorry, the, the one I just the NAT assigned public IP address for, which is also called a reflexive ad candidate. I'm going to use that word later on. You can also use relays. Uh, I'm not going to cover those in, in this presentation. Uh, then, and then what you do is, is that what the device does, it, it yeah, you can't let me talk to the microphone. Oh, sorry, yeah, I, I'm going to wake you up. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 uh, okay. Um, so, so what you're doing, uh, what an endpoint does is, uh, if of course, in order for you to know what my candidates are, I have to inform them in one way or another to you. And in order for me to, 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 to inform you, I, I need to find, find out what they are. Now, there are some cases you have this PCP and, and protocols where, where, where you know, I can control an app and then I will get that information. But in most cases, and, 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 and uh, you don't have those, and, 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 and in IoT, you're probably not going to have those, uh, at least not in constraint. So basically, you're going to fetch this. So you're going to fetch this. In ICE, you have specific protocols for doing this. There's a protocol called STUN, and, and you also have specific infrastructure for this. You have STUN servers. You have something which you call term delays. Stun server, and, and then uh, I'm going to show a picture of what those are. Then you're going to create these candidates, and then you're going to distribute them in one way or another. ICE doesn't define how you do it. It depends on what signaling protocols and what you have. Uh, for SDP, those who are familiar with VoIP session description protocol, which is a very probably the most common protocol for, for, for distributing candidates. And then when you receive my candidates, you're going to see whether you can contact me using using those. Uh, here you have an example of this server reflexive end, uh, candidate. The endpoint is sending some kind of request. This would be a stun in normalize to a server somewhere that would be a stun server. And this is actually the, the this, uh, the, the, here you have the NAT. This is the public IP address and port created by the NAT, which is called the server reflexive address. Which is the address that the server is seeing? That's where he, when he gets that request, this is the IP address and port that he sees. Then he can return it back to you, and, and you're gonna know. Okay, this is my candidate at that address. Uh, then that's what's ICE. So what is thin ICE? It's basically the usage of COP protocol and infrastructure to to implement ICE. And again, you could insert another protocol here if you want to. And and, 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 and and you can define it for this. Here we describe how you're doing it for, for core. And the reason why you would do that, because if you have constrained devices, for example, you may not want to implement this, or you're, you're, you're not able to implement this done, for example. You may not, if you already have your co-op infrastructure, you don't want to deploy these stun servers and everything like that. Maybe you already have them, and then you may be able to reuse them, but in, in case you don't. So basically, thin ice, what it Applying eyes on, on co-op or, or, or some other 
constrained uh, protocol or protocol for constrained devices. No, here I'm looking at the same steps which I, I described for, for, for eyes. First, you're going to fetch this or get this candidate so you can distribute them. Now, instead of, we, uh, instead of stun, we're actually going to use the pro call protocol here and we're going to use a, 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 a call resource. Uh, then they create the candidates, nothing strange there, you do it in the same way. And then when you're distributing them, we're actually going to use the core protocol and the resource directory and, and resource links. They have some, uh, I showed you then how it works. So everything you see in bold here is things that you already have if you have a co-op uh, infrastructure. So you don't need to, to add anything extra if, if, if you want this uh, natural version. The first thing you did, and, and this, this is how you're going to fetch these addresses. So basically, there is going to be, a, I talked about you had this server in the network where you send this uh, request, and he looks where the IP address, where it comes from, and then sends it back to you. You have the same thing here. We call it a T-STAN server, but basically, it's just a co-op server which hosts a resource, a dedicated resource, which we call reflexive resource. And the only thing what's going to happen is when you send a co-op request to this resource, you want to you want to read the value of the resource. Server is going to look where the request came from, the IP address and port. It's going to assign that value to the resource, and then it's going to return it to you. So this resource will actually get its value when it receives the request. Then, if you have multi, you may have multiple devices communicating with it. So it may get a, a, a get request from another one, and then it's going to assign get assign the value from where that request comes and returns. So this will, this is a little different than, than normally resources because this will get the resource value when it receives the request. And then it's going to send it back. Uh, and then obviously now you have, you have sent this call request through the NAT, so you need to maintain the binding also open. So then you can keep sending this every now and then depending on, on there are different ways to find out how, how long the NAT binding is going to stay up. And, and the good thing about that, because if it happens that the NAT binding goes down, then you will see, because it's every time going to return you this reflective address. And if the NAT binding, for whatever reason, has gone down, then you will see that because next time it's probably good, the NAT is going to create another IP address and port for you, and, and, and you will get that back. Uh, yeah. The first thing, and, and here you have a picture of this. You, um, you send a GET request. You have the reflexive resource, which is the its address to its TSAN server. And it sends back, for example, a 205 content. And this is the address, which is here, which you read from the request and sends back to you. And, and now you have it. So now you can distribute it to, to some other one here who wants to contact you. Now, how are you going to do that? And this is uh, this is in two parts. First, you have this uh, the one hosting the candidate or wants to dis distribute it. Uh, the then point the hosting candidate. And there are two ways of doing this. He can create a resource by himself, which we call candidate resource. And the only value of this resource is this IP address and port that he received from when, when he looked for it. It's not a sensor value or anything else. It's just this IP address and port. He's creating those, and then he's creating a link for that, a resource link. And, and here you have, so, so the link to your eye contains this IP address and, and, and a port. Define a new relation, which we call candidate. And, and the anchor, so this is actually, you, you can link this URI or this link to a, to a real, resource. Uh, I talk about the sensor resource linkages, but this could be whatever other things you, you resources you expose. So basically you can say that this is a candidate for this resource. Uh, so that's the first way of doing it. And then you're going to register both of these to the resource director. And, the, and this is where the resource directory comes. You register these resource links to a resource directory and then other endpoints can, can fetch those. So that's the first way of doing it. The other way is that you take your uh, register sensor, uh, sorry, your sensor resource link, and you put the IP address or this uh, uh, candidate information directly into the URI of that. 
So, so you replace whatever this local IP address and port that, that the resource link contains with this uh, candidate IP address and port. There are pros and cons for both of these methods. Uh, I will not go into those here now because of time issues, but, but you can do both ways. And then whoever wants to contact you, basically the one that's going to use this candidate. So he fetches this from a resource directory, normal procedures. Now in the first alternative, he will fetch both the, the resource link for the candidate and there is, for example, the sensor resource link. And again, you, you have this anchor and this, so you can map this together. So, so you know that this is a candidate for, for, for this resource. Then he will replace uh, when he's going to send a get for to read your the sensor value, he will put the uh, IP, the, re, uh, the candidate into this link URI, and then he will send the get. Instead, normally he would try to send it directly here, but now he will send it to this uh, address here, and, and hopefully it will reach reach. So you can read the sensor value. And the other way is that this is going to where there's nothing new here. If, 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 the, if the sensor resource link already contains the, the, the candidate, the IP address and port, he's just going to use normal uh, resource director procedures. He's going to fetch the resource link associated with the, with the sensor and, and he's going to send a get and, and hopefully it will reach. Here is a flow showing the thing, same thing. First, you have the first device number one. He's the one who's actually going to, to, to fetch and, and distribute his, his uh, uh, candidates. So he contacts this t stand server, gets his, uh, this public IP address and port, this server reflects it. Then he's, uh, sorry, no. Yes, he, he's using this embedded for clarity. He's using embedded. So he gets this. And then when he re registers his uh, sensor resource link, instead of putting his own IP address and port, he actually puts this uh, uh, in, in, into the co-op message. And here it seems to be, yeah, I would say yeah exactly. Oh, I'm sorry for that. Yeah. And, and, and uh, actually, he doesn't. He, he, he uses the mechanism. Oh, I'm sorry. So he, he, norm, he, he registers his sensor resource link using his normal IP address, but then he also registers this um, awesome. candidate. Yeah, sorry for that. Yeah, bubble. <laughs> yeah. But and here you see, here he actually includes this uh, candidate uh, IP address, the, the relation, this candidate, and, and uh, the anchor. And here, this uh, IP address port is the same one as here. So this is how it links them together. Right? Because you, you need to know, because there may be multiple devices subscribing. You don't really do anything with a candidate unless you know what, what, what you can use it for, right? So, 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 so that's actually, so this was the first step. This is how he distributes his, his, his the, the candidates to the, to the, yeah. and again, if you would use the second method, you would put the, it directly here into the sensor resource link, the, the NAT address, and you would skip this step. The other one, then you have device yeah. two. Yes, like I said earlier, you will have to send this key lives, obviously, in if you're using this. Uh, so, um, uh, you will have to send key lives, and this is what I said normally the way it works in ICE, you can send the key lives to the same place here. Now in ICE, you can send keep alive without getting any reply. Basically, you, you, you can send an empty UDP packet or, or something like that, or a stun indication. The good thing about sending a request to actually trigger a response is that you will always get this back. So you will see, for example, if the NAT binding has gone down or if it has created a new NAT binding. Mm -hmm. So that's always a choice you, you will have to. If you don't care or if you trust it's not going to be done, you can just send something simple, which is not going to so much process. Okay. But it's then really every 20 seconds or something that it gets was kind of the observed time. I don't think the NAT bind, well. It's 30 seconds what I saw often, so it's really. Yeah, yeah, well, it, of course, um, like I said in the beginning, 
I skip that for here. If he's controlling the NAT, he's supporting PCP or some of these protocols, then it obviously doesn't need to support. But then, of course, he's not going to need to contact him either because he will get his public IP address support from from, from here directly. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, this, this looks like Really, really strong argument, right? Yeah, I, 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 I didn't want to go there. Uh, I, I wish I had one of my colleagues working for a big. Uh... So the reason I, I would say that actually it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, I have people I see saying, but it's a lot more. Actually, IPv6 is gonna reduced some of the need for this, but it's not going please, to please do publish this right because it'll actually encourage the IPs. People are, will be able to pick their poison, right? Yeah. So but anyway, uh, 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 yeah. So sorry. Yeah. Um, so the reason why I was saying that there's a lot more need for There's also a case for privacy. I think it's a privacy for the ULA. You're absolutely right. The ULA, mining for ULA can last a long, long time. You don't have to worry about it. It's a lot simpler architecture. I mean, you're, you're doing what you have to do, given up. Yeah, and uh, sure. And, and I mean, there are other reasons why people will. will Maintain nuts also in IPv6, but maybe this is not the. Uh, I'll try to. to uh, but, anyways, yeah, so I'll just. Sorry for rushing, but I'm trying to. to, to. So then, device two, he wants to contact him. And now, obviously, he, there is an act here, so he will not be able to contact him using his local IP address. Uh, so then, he's using again normal. Uh, a resource director procedure. He wants to. He wants to have um, uh, a temperature sensor link. He gets that one back. Then he also want. He's asking for a candidate, which again using the anchor, which is associated with this one. He, he gets this one back. This is the the the, the, the pub, uh, not public IP address support and everything. And he takes this one, puts it into the get, and and, and sends it here. It may reach and may not. This did obviously you have different things. NATs can be, you know, some are more restricted than other where, where, where they're gonna let traffic through. But again, like I said, there are there are relays and other things, but this is the basic idea. He gets the cope, they get uh, they, this, and then he sends the response back with, with train 22 to, or whatever the temperature value is. So this is basically the use case, normal co-op usage. This is not about you know setting up a real-time media stream or anything between these two devices. This is basically using the resource directory, trying to, to find the resource links for the data if he's interested in temperature, for example, or whatever, and then contacting the guy who is who is behind the NAT. Obviously, he, he may also be behind the NAT, so he may do the same thing, registering his candidates and, and everything. These are, of course, into the details. You could, of course, have, have, have put their information. Yeah, also, I, I also have a, a, a candidate that you want, may want to look for. But here, I'm, I'm just assuming he, he gets this, and then he just sends this and asks, hey, by the way, that, does he also have a candidate? Is there a candidate? What are more candidates associated with this angle? If it wouldn't be, then he would, of course, send four or something. But in this case, he wants to send here. Yeah, I, 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 sure. Yeah, I mean, yes. No, what I, again, to try to keep it simple, he's asking for it once. And if he's only interested in, in, in accessing him once, he wouldn't observe. But if he's going to do it more often, yes, he could make an observation. And then he will get it. And if, for example, he, he notices when he does his thing here that he gets a new IP address or a new candidate, he will update it, the registration, and then he will get the not notification about it. Yes. Uh, yeah. 
and and these were the I, I mentioned all of this already. So so that that was kind of be nice in, in a nutshell. Uh, the semantic is interesting things here, and I mentioned for for example, I said you have this reflexive resource. This was a resource where you send your get and it reads your value. So this is kind of interesting because, like I said, it doesn't have a value all the time that you read, for example, a temperature value. It gets the value when it receives your request and then it sends that back. And it's going to get a new value when it gets a request from, from someone else. Then you had a candidate resource, which is basically uh, this is not a value representing anything physical in the endpoint. It's not a temperature or a battery or anything. It's this uh, value which is assigned by NAT uh, or, 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 or a relay or whatever you get your public IP address for. And then maybe the most interesting is, is this candidate resource link because as we know, the resource links, they don't provide, typically they don't, they don't provide the resource value, right? They just get the link. This is from where you can get the value, and then you get the same value. But of course, in this case, because the value, the IP address, the not IP address support itself is actually the value of the resource. And since you're going to put that into the resource link URI, it's actually you are going to provide value in the So, so that that that's kind of interesting uh, aspects of the whole thing. And, and like I said, yes, there is a new this link relationship is called candidates. Then you use this anchor. I mean, this could be other ways to do this. So, so I think that's all I had. And uh, it went very quickly, but I, I want to do the test. So, so uh, again, I, I'm also going to be at the hackathon. So, 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 so if anyone is interested. In this talking about it, I mean, is this something we should maybe? There is no draft about this, no? so this is just representing the study I've done. So, so maybe we should go over it one way or another. Uh, those are, uh, yeah, discovery. Yeah, like I said, the, the distance server. It's just a, a, a cloud server hosting a specific uh, resource. It's just a resource. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, uh, I, yeah, I, I called it, uh, where was it, uh, Fetch? I called it uh, reflexive resource. Yeah, this is what I called yeah. This is basically the resource where he is addressing his. Exactly. Exactly. And, exactly. And, and of course, this could be maybe this could be. I mean, this is just a, a function. This could be the resource directory itself, or also, it could, or it could be anywhere. I think in ICE normally to utilize this is something you normally would configure. It's interesting to just discover it outside your network. So it's not just like you can't just do a dry get, but to actually get to the map and then you discover things outside your network. Inside resource directory might have a link to the outside resource directory. That's just that's all. Right, right. But I'm just saying it's not, you can't just do MDS. Yeah. And this obviously has to be the public network. This, this is also sort of devices behind the network. Because they need to go through the NAT and then. So, uh, so I don't remember who mentioned, but my map was okay, one of which or I is. Here is one potential solution, which is, of course, rather heavyweight because that's going to solve various different kind of curious uh, topologies with NAS. There are simplified five ways to have seen more simple uh, scenario, but this has been something that has been you know, well tested by the concept of the multiple space, and uh, how this is in general, is how it could be applied. Or, or, I do want to say I picked on it, it's done in turn, and a lot of things over your ISP cooperate. So, access to public network, you know, whether you can actually reach everything you need to get to uh, the Sure, there may be other policies in the network which, which you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is, this is, uh, you should definitely publish something on this. Yeah. 
because you go to town on just why people should be having a six. I mean, in this particular use case for IoT, and I'm not joking. There are all sorts of reliability issues that that NAT brings in, especially in the service provider with CG NAT. Transparency there. It's harmful if the, if the server actually has to get the IoT device actually to get something that actually has to work reliably. Well, I think what's really interesting here is analyze the failure maps. Yeah. There are all things that go wrong, right? Uh, you know, one of the IoT blocks is uh, for the NAT changes very frequently. So, uh, or the NAT reboots, or loses state. What's, yeah, in, yeah, what's, so what's in the directory in one place? I'm looking at the ways it can go wrong <laughs> with the ops. Uh, using rigorous sun time, for example, which is what we're doing. You have these EDP messages that are working uh, as you use some of these messages. Just that, but as soon as you use EDP, you can drop all the other. And we won't use it with the bus that has a sun server. Sorry? It was awesome. Sure. I mean, you, you need. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. That's a good point. So if you had a malicious stun server, could it like refresh your traffic? Yeah. I mean, in, in, in stun, you 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 have you you have all you know, these authentication and those kind of things. So maybe that's something that that they're doing. But but really, honestly, yeah. 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 Do, do do people think this is? I assume that the first place for this would be maybe the, the, the this research group or what? Well, it's um, not that we could do in core, it's just that. Uh, I would start, I would really start to write out the use case. Now, for more of what you guys want to do. That, that's a good introduction to the other specifications. You know, I, I can talk with the chair about that and then we can see what that is. As long as I'm interested, because otherwise I'm going to Right, it, but how, I was going to say, how in this case out there? So, for instance, for mobile media, the, it's not clear that the system needs to be supported with just mobile media. But for, say, a little IoT use case, I suspect that once you're crossing an app or you're expecting to cross an app, what you're really doing is you're running the real project service. What? If you're expecting to cross an app boundary, what you really want to go for is probably doing a, a, a cloud based laundry tool, which is it's a different, in a way, it's an evolution on the stock. You you could use that for for this too. I mean, obviously, as long as the device, as long as I mean, it did. I mean, it did. This could of course be a, a cloud server, and, right. and, and 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 as long as long as the device behind that is the one initiating the, the connection, right? Then you don't need any any of this to call someone. He's going to the public network, and and he will initiate the connection, and and he can have his team and get a PC and whatever he gets something. But again, if he wants to establish a, a connection with device one, the one that's behind the maps, you could use this mechanism for that too. Yeah. But what, what I'm getting at is that with the, I think for most of these use cases that the maps involve, probably what you're doing is, is, is adding uh, the resource advertised to whatever cloud based service. Mm -hmm. And so what people all they do is they just well, everybody just connects the cloud based service to the cloud service routes and they just try and get it to cloud. The only times that doesn't work is when you have a vast amount of bandwidth involved or where latency becomes an issue. Latency has to, you know, the people you have to do to have a latency problem that is greater than about a milliseconds. And so many cloud many decent cloud based services have a lot of problems. So I, I think Challenge here will be exactly what question you ask, which is is there a real use case here? 
know, if I look at the way that we're able to, you know, this WebEx, everything's going through central servers. Nothing's going peer to peer. The same is true with most of the OPC. So now the question to me is, you know, is this something that might be in the industrial setting or in the smart city setting or something like that? Even in the smart home, one thing that we see is a lot of multiple virtual silos going through cloud services unnecessarily. We hear a lot of unnecessarily. What is the evolution of more local connectivity uh, and national? Look at Mozilla, who can play with a thing, you know, a local, you know, a rule manager, whatever. A lot of those are behind the NAT, but what if you have local NATs in the home environment or you don't want to uh, have a safety network for the moment? So uh, on the whole, right, if you look at the way Google has gone with their APIs and a lot of other things that use their APIs, it has absolutely nothing to do, you know, you're, you're, it's not peer-to-peer, -peer, it's all public to the cloud. Right. They want to sell cloud services. Right. Well, but not only that, but there's good reason for it. You know, the, the whole reason for that model is to reduce costs and improve the price. Right? And, to, and, and there's actually a lot of environmental benefit. Well, yeah, I think what you're saying, you, you're, you're, you're questioning the whole concept of digital protection. In the home. In the home. I, I feel differently elsewhere. Like, I think the, the resource directory model for the industrial, the, for, for a building model, in this case, is, I think that's stronger. But in the home, I don't see it happening. You know, precisely because there's a uh, you know, Right now, it's closed. There, there's a lot of big ecosystems. Everything's going up there with clouds. They're doing some cloud to cloud communication, some APIs built building on top. If that sounds like it's a you know, bad thing because you don't end up with an openly interoperable world, maybe I've popped it to that point. But there is this benefit that, okay, I've just reduced. My memory, my memory is, uh, uh, usage on those devices by maybe sixty percent, right? Maybe more, maybe eighty percent, and in rooms, and I might even reduce my processing requirements on that device by a similar amount, which is power consumption. Yeah. I'm not convinced that going to the cloud reduces the power consumption on small devices. It increases them to be able to support, you know, more. Couple stacks go handle the first internet. So then there's a, a researcher at Berkeley who I think should be looking at that problem. He's still getting into the problem. His name is Serge Abelman. Serge just did, this is, I mean, we're getting off into the yeah, so, so, sure. so I, I'll take that off. You know, you can discuss it over here. Thanks for the question. And that gives us three minutes for final discussion. I thought it was a challenge. We have a little logistics uh, item. Um, so, most people who want to continue. Office. Uh, you can meet today at uh, 7. Uh, which is in the same way as the two items uh, meeting address in the base in number one, called 44E. Um, and we have a table for six minutes here. Uh, for those people here, going to come.
Which is excellent. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
is why you do a lot of small scale tracing, right? Is you're testing it out for your hair it works, and then you know, before you roll it out for a lot of scale. So I think some of this probably you can work in your head is already it's a case in point, the heart for love for a moment. If you did not implement a single automated feature in your network from a perspective, just having a declaration from the devices about what sort of access the device is required for formal You know, you can test them and say, do you know? Because if they don't know, how the heck are you supposed to make sure that you can get access to the data? Likewise, the description, there's no tooling, it's formal documentation. No devices do. Right, which is useful. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and this, we should talk more about how mud and pure descriptions come together. If you want to know, because this also ties to another part of what's going on in this, which is somewhat nature, and it's, I, it may even be misguided. Is the, the idea of software uh, builds and materials. And so the, the idea of a software build and materials is that if you have a if you have a like an IoT device that has a large number of software components, how do you know if it's vulnerabilities? So MUD is all about vulnerabilities, you know, protecting against vulnerabilities and the fact that you buy, that that stand but just saying you have a printer doesn't tell you whether you have a vulnerability. Same you have the HP 4000. Sorry. Is it the sort of Right, so this is, yes, if you're, if you're using Swift, so the same people are in the room. Okay, uh, so while well, the Meyer is in the room, for instance. And, um, this may involve the people who are the developer of the game, so you can't talk a lot about the things that don't own it. Right, right. Because there's some massive software. And, and, and there, then there's the relationship between the two. So, for instance, what would a how, how might the software build materials um, help build out the thin description or vice versa? Right, right. Uh, what's the, so I think the whole issue of software packaging, as you guys talked about executing, is really important for containers and everything. Um, and even Twitter and Yammer have to be on that automated. But just a bit of a side, a more general follow up. Of how do we avoid reinventing the wheel? So uh, the standards landscape is so complicated, right? That you know there's there's this uh, investment time just just kind of understand just understanding how it works, right? And uh, to figure out how to put it together. So, so it's all there, but get some technical what feature that actually does. Right. right. I think I mean, I've been spending a lot of time on this just to understand the business of the market. So I wonder how we can. So we put his brain in the bottle. So I thought what's interesting about this, right, is I could imagine a thing description where I could take the thing description, generate a, essentially an intermediate form of a mud file where it's you know it, it says here, well, based on the fact that we do protocols and we do protocol bindings. Here's the, um, yeah. here's the access that's needed. We just need to fill in the point. More generally, I have a set of things that change. I have uh, some rules of how they connect. From that, can I infer one of the necessary network configuration and all those things together in that way? Yes. And then the network can enforce that policy that someone can't change. Notice things are not going Right. So MUD is actually based on the access control model. Right. So you could. Actually, skip the mud part if you want, um, and just do the access control, the underlying access control model for that purpose, and that would be perfect. But I don't think we answered the question. What's this? The only conclusion is that the companies come from all the maps, many of them don't have their proper way to do it. So, I advise them to do um, first of all, articulate your system requirements and assumptions in the form of the app and what you are putting your system and whether you are buying them. If you are buying them very broadly, you need to buy them. And you are giving them any kind of full system of standards. Not technical, not technical, not technical, not technical, not technical, not 
Also, the whole idea of blocking the products, we've got super useful for us. What, where the gap, what's needed, you know, what are the missing pieces? Yeah, that's why I was asking about it. So we've got to put one test hundreds of devices uh, that we kept as a like a point of three days of instant restriction. I think what's missing though is uh, uh, more open source information that I think I have some but I haven't done the process of course now. Okay, so we can Sorry for the, we didn't have much fun, guys. Nobody mentioned the logistics of getting back. We have a whole lot of last night. Well, each uh, man after himself. So, downstairs the receptionist, there's a number for a cat. A grab. Oh, so then, yeah. Yeah, the transit map could be to that. I suggest you have a harder run in the game. Well, I think if we want to show the cap. Okay, yeah, we'll go on to your cap. I think the emergency. Yeah, let's see. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's see. 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 Let's see.